Hey everyone, it's a new episode of Flick City. I asked Eric Holmes, who's doing all these interviews, he said, instead of tightening the podcast, just interviews, just we will resume our Flick City coverage. Instead of me doing interviews, it is Eric Holmes doing the interviews for our Cinematics universe. Eric, like you said on our Wednesday episode of Cinematics, you have thousands of interviews that we haven't used yet. We can only do two for this episode. Tell us what these two interviews, sets of interviews are. Well, one I just finished uh, earlier today. It was uh, as we're recording this. I, you know, not earlier today as you're hearing this. That's a different time. <laughs> yes. We are we are living in a time continuum, though. <laughs> um, but uh, I was uh, with the uh, writer director Stephen Asher. He did a short film called Looking Forward, and it's kind of a, a video essay, kind of. And it's hard to describe, but basically, I think the main concept is that uh, Stephen Asher was tooling around with some AI, various AI things that you have online. And uh, at one point, he asked the question of what does humanity's future look like? And then got a response back. Talking to him, it didn't, this is not how it went, but this is kind of how it comes across of him kind of thinking about the future and kind of, uh, what what do you call that? Oh, geez, uh, foreshadowing, mind. foreshadowing of... No, kind of like uh, just talking to himself about like what things mean and oh, like self-reflective, re- self re- self-reflection, or a little bit, yeah, a little okay. bit of that, a little bit of when you just let your mind go, you're kind of brainstorming, just go. Okay, free thinking. I'm, free- I, I, I'm not doing any of this. <laughs> I'm trying to recall and spontaneous, cannot... yeah, sp- spontaneous but, thinking or yeah, free thinking. But anyway, it 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 comes off like an essay, like he's just kind of going the stream of stream of conscious. There you go. Mm-hmm. It's like a stream of conscious. Of course, he didn't write it that way, but that's kind of how it comes across. It's just him sort of. Yeah, kind of reflecting on the what the AI answered them. And th- this is like 12 minutes long. And I've watched it. Well, I've watched it like twice, but then I listened to it like four or five times after that. Because it's, I mean, first of all, it's short enough. And second of all, like he's got a really soothing voice. And third of all, it's just kind of like, uh, I don't know if you ever go on YouTube and listen to uh, certain people talk. Like mm-hmm. I love listening to like Christopher Hitchens or Harlan Nelson just kind of rant about things. Yeah. This is a, now Stephen Asher is not really ranting. He's more kind of considering things, but it, it's kind of that same thing. Just listening to someone talk that's got some ideas and just kind of laying it out there. And it's, it's really fun to listen to or what kind of sets it apart from stuff like that is that all the not all the visuals but most of the visuals are also ai generated so yeah, it ad- cool. it adds it adds a bit of surrealness to what the short is so you hear them talking and doing the stream of conscious thing but also you get these like you've seen ai pictures where it's like you know you, you blink at it and it's like oh yeah this is a picture oh, wait no 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 that's kind of that there's something off about that so it's got a little bit of a surreal nature to the way it is and it's 12 minutes check it out i think it comes out this weekend i'm not sure when well, it comes out here, it, look- it just it, it just played at a New York Doc Festival, and I believe it's uh, it'll be available really soon. Okay. So we'll, we'll hopefully we'll provide a link where you can catch Looking Forward and sort of yes. just the official plot synopsis. Quote, with stunning black and white stills, the film examines conflicted emotions through the expressionistic vision of AI. These uncanny AI images serve as a vehicle for traversing time and place, giving the film the aesthetic pull of great science fiction. But in this film... The science fiction is real. Again, that is looking forward. 12 minutes short interview with Stephen Asher is coming up right now. But before we get to actually not right now, but in a couple of seconds, what's the second interview you did, Eric? Uh, the next one is with uh, writer director Terrence Martin, who did a movie called Get Away If You Can. And he also he uh, previously did a movie called The Donner Party. We talk a little, well, we talk about both movies during the interview because the interviews pretty long but terrence martin is a cool guy he was just on the force five podcast and i believe he'll be on the middle class film class this movie is available to rent currently and it should be on tubi don't okay. know the day i think towards the beginning of december it should be on tubi but i get away with if you can greg th- this is like a movie that normally i do not gravitate towards but i think you and bruce would love this one I don't know if either of you have seen it yet, but this is like a Greg and Bruce movie for sure. This is not an Erica movie. 
but I still like this a lot. And I think the reason why I like this a lot is that the air quote quiet moments when air quote nothing is happening, it's always pushing the relationship forward. It's always pushing the story forward. And it does it with, uh, I don't want to say silent filmmaking, but like there's dialogue in this. And there's, you know, a good amount of dialogue in it, but there's certain scenes where the characters don't talk to each other and you know everything you need to know about these characters. It's just a really good relationship piece. And at times it seems like it's going to go horror. Doesn't really, but it's a, it's just a, a good movie overall. Okay, here you it is. Check it out. Quote, a tense and intimate relationship drama. Filmmaking duo, like Eric was saying, Terrence Martin and Dominique Braun star in the story of a married couple pushed to the brink during a sailing trip that turns into something else entirely. Again, co-starring Ed Harris out available where you rent purchase movies. So check it out. We'll provide a link for that as well. Yes, sir. I should be noted that Dominique Braun is also the co-writer and director. Uh, she was not there for the interview, but I believe Terrence and Dominique are husband and wife. Okay, cool. And then, of course, you got Ed Harris showing up in flashbacks and who didn't love Ed Harris, right? Yeah, that's very, very cool. Okay, so again, get away if you can. The, ter- the interview with Terrence Martin is coming up shortly as well. So again, Stephen Asher, right? Eric Holmes, Stephen Asher? Yep. Stephen Asher for Looking Forward and Terrence Martin for Get Away If You Can. All, all that information will be provided in our cinematic show notes. Also, before we go, I've been doing some work on our Cinematics YouTube channel. It's been an on and off thing since I think 2015 or 2016. Now, the cool thing about it is they YouTube now pulls the RSS feed links. So if you want to actually listen to our cinematics podcast by not using Amazon Music or Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Podcast or whatever you use, you can go to your YouTube app, look up cinematics, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and our podcast feed will pop up and you can listen to our audio feed that way. So that's it. I, I know, Eric, you occasionally use YouTube, especially I remember during the early days of movie mainline and find your film you were purchasing movies to rent on youtube you still do that you still oh yeah okay (laughs) you still do that That, well because i got the you know i got my card linked to it so if if it's streaming on youtube or available to rent it's much easier to go through that than it is amazon okay eric i've been doing interviews since 91 so i still like doing interviews you've been doing interviews last two and a half years i'm assuming eric you still okay with yeah. the interview stuff? You're, you're still uh, you're still uh, prime and ready to interview. You're okay yeah. with that? I, I like doing them in the moment, and then when I think back on them, like I'm such an idiot. Why did I ask that question? Why didn't I ask <laughs> oh, this? So it, it's just like constant second guessing myself. But you know, the people I get to talk to are all cool. The PR people uh, do great work, and they're good to kind of like I don't get to talk to them long after the interview's yeah, sure. over. But yeah, it's uh, it's. Good people are around. I haven't had a bad experience yet. Yeah. In fact, my one bad experience was my own mess up. And the uh, director was a talker and saved that interview. So that's, uh, <laughs> thank him for that. Yes. So again, Cinematics YouTube channel, a lot of Eric's interviews will be there. We, I mean, so I'm, I'm trying to grow our Cinematics universe in that YouTube channel. And so a lot of that stuff, there's still a lot of interviews that Eric has done that I haven't uploaded as of yet. There's going to be My Heart Can't Beat Unless You Tell It To is coming up. There's a whole bunch of other stuff coming down the pike. There's a possible, I don't know if it's going to happen, but we'll see if the interviews cor- get cor- like kind of corrected. Cabbage Patch Kids, probably. Worst case scenario, we'll talk about on cinematics, right? Great, interesting yeah. Cabbage Patch documentary. Documentary. Anything else off the top of your head that you are you might have? Uh... Uh, in about a half hour, I'll be talking to the uh, director of Do Justice. Uh, oh. That's coming out next next week. Okay. Uh, yeah, Billion Dollar Baby. I'm supposed to do that tomorrow. That had a, that was earlier today, but it had to be rescheduled for tomorrow as of recording. Obviously, we're living in a time loop. But uh, yeah, uh, we, oh. we got some we got some good ones coming up. So and I'm as, pretty excited about it. And, and as of this recording, I forgot. Eric in 45 minutes has an interview. Have a good time prepping. We will see you next week. Thank you, Eric Holmes, for all your work. On, and of course, we love you too, Bruce Berkey. We love everyone. Thank you guys for listening to Cinematics. Is there a way to sign off for our, our Flick City pod? You wanna, do, do you want to do a branded sign off right off uh, the top? Hey, guys. How'd you like them in Maples? <laughs> okay. We'll, we're going to work on it next week, guys. We'll see. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll we'll workshop good, it a bit. <laughs> we'll, we're we're going to workshop it. Eric has an interview to prepare, prep for, and hope you guys get some value added stuff from these interviews. Take care, guys. Talk to you soon.
Well, I'm here with Stephen Asher, the uh, writer and director of Looking Forward. It, this is very strange. It's like a, it was described as a video essay. Definitely uh, feels that. The images are, mo- not all, but most of the images are AI generated, which adds a really uh, surreal. So the way you have the short, it seems like a stream of consciousness or a stream of thought. Mm-hmm. And then with the AI images, it adds a real, really surreal kind of feel to it. Where did the whole uh, concept of this come from? Well, the, it, the project kind of got its start. I discovered this amazing book called The Third Reich of Dreams, which was uh, written by a researcher in Germany in uh, 1933. She was having, uh, Charlotte Barrett was having nightmares about Hitler's rise to power. And she thought it would be interesting to interview other people about their dreams during this time. It was an incredibly powerful book, and people were kind of processing what Hitler meant even before the worst had happened uh, subconsciously in their dreams. So I started trying to get the rights to the book and experimenting with AI imagery as a way to kind of capture dreamlike analogs to you know what was going on. We, we, you know, AI is this incredible tool where you can type in uh, text prompts and then get images. And at the time that I was doing it, the algorithm was more primitive than it is now. And so what was coming out were these images that had errors in them that were actually fascinating and very expressionistic. Faces are not carefully rendered. Sometimes you would get you know bizarre errors like three arms, but other times you'd get these just really fascinating things like uh, I, I asked for two men wearing fedoras in a room in 1930 talking on a phone because that was it one of the dreams and it rendered and in, in the afternoon light which you can also specify the quality of the image and it rendered this amazing shot of these two guys in fedoras almost a hopper like painting and one of them was talking on an iphone because that's what the ai thought a phone looked like so i i saw a lot of potential in this in this, in this tool and as it turned out i couldn't get rights to that book But I then pivoted because I was thinking about how resonant, the reason the Hitler theme had been so resonant is so much about what was going on in our own country, about how institutions were being undermined and, you know, democratic principles were being undermined in plain sight and people were acting like it was no big deal or a lot of people were. So I started to think about the kinds of threats that we're all under and the ones that we pay attention to and the ones that we ignore. You know, like everyone else, we had all gone through the pandemic and the lockdown and isolation and, you know, both feeling uh, fearful about the future and cut off from the rest of society and kind of wondering what the future meant. You know, I'd always thought of myself as an optimist, but I was beginning to wonder if that was right and if I still did or if that was actually uh, a useful way to think about what was going on in the world. So I ended up making a much more personal film about my own thoughts about, you know, both the future and history and how do we deal with all the things that, you know, threaten us in our lives or or, or seem dangerous and how, how do we put them in perspective? I mean, this is definitely a pessimistic thought, but when uh, humans have often not worked in our own best interests, so you wonder, like, if uh, if we're heading towards uh, towards danger, towards our own self destruction, and then we continue. You mentioned the boiling the frog sort of thing. Maybe our species deserves to be <laughs> self eradicated. Right. Well, I mean, that I mean, everyone always uses that cliche of, you know, frogs and boiling water that they they will stay until they die, you know, which I think is funny because I think if you put a frog in water at all, it will probably hop out anyway. Yeah. But, you know, just that sense that we don't see what's really going on. You know, there are a lot of things that are going have been going on and continue to go on that are very dangerous. And people, you know, they want to go about their lives or they, you know, they don't really think about that. On the other hand, you know, part of the message of the film as you go through it is, you know, that's not a way you can live, being in in constant fear and vigilance. And so there has to be another way to kind of integrate this into your life. And I don't want to, you know, kind of give away the arc of the film too much, but it's not a film without hope or without a sense of how to how to package some of those uh, threats and fears into something that makes sense within a, a person's life. 
I mean, you said that you don't want to give away the arc of the film. I would argue that this is in, impossible to give away because it, it's it's such a stream of consciousness. It's like I'd watch this twice and then just kind of put it on my phone and listen to it because you got such a soothing voice. I could probably listen to you do ASMR, but like just kind of listening to it over and over again. Uh, you yeah. kind of pick up on little because th- it's in this short amount of time. It's so dense, and you yeah. pose so many questions. Like, yeah. what's what's the writing process of this? Like, like is it stream of consciousness? Like, you just wrote it down, and it's like, yep, that uh, probably got to change these couple words, but otherwise it's good. Or did it take a yeah. take a while to kind of? Right, it's interesting. I, I mean, one of the things I'm I'm really loving in in the people that have seen the film. Almost everybody says I had to watch it twice or more than twice, or I, I keep coming back to it. And that's incredibly wonderful. I mean, it is, it, there's a lot to unpack in the film. And so the, the process was, you know, thinking about different, you know, it, it's, it's broken into chapters and thinking about the different chapters, you know, an, an important chapter also is my own family's history. Um, my grandfather was born in Ukraine and they had to escape pogroms that because you know Jews were being killed and they, fortunately my family got out alive everybody else in this town died either in the pogrom or in the holocaust my family story was another one of those chapters and i would you know write things and narrate them and create imagery to support that and i worked on it for you know i don't know 4 months or so pretty much in isolation not sure if it was a film or not and you know kind of feeling like it, maybe it wouldn't make sense to other people and then i brought it to my wife Jeannie, who's also my film partner and said you know do you think this is a thing do you think this does this make sense or scan and she it really did and she found it very moving and deep and that was an incredible encouragement to me to keep going and refining so it isn't it isn't stream of consciousness in the sense that it all came out at the same time it's lots of iterations and hearing what you know showing it to a few trusted friends and seeing what made sense or what didn't another thing that's been really interesting to me is that these images are meant to be very you know i use the word expressionistic but you know full of uh, stimulating you in different ways and some people find them really disturbing some people find them really fascinating sometimes in combination so kind of working with those and creating new images because you know if anybody has ever tried using ai generative ai it's a very back and forth iterative process you put in a prompt you tell it you want it to look like a certain way, you get an image, and then you say, okay, don't do this, change the date, change what they're wearing, change their position, and you go back and forth. So it often takes many iterations to get the image that you like. So at the beginning of this, you ask the AI a question about the future, and then it answers it, and then that seems to be the kind of where the where the short goes. Yeah. Is there a version of this where the AI just says, uh, there's flying unicorns and uh, everything's made out of peanut butter it's like oh this is gonna be a very strange short right well i was already thinking about those very issues uh, so when i asked the ai what are the things we had to worry about and it came back with exactly the things i was thinking about i i knew i was on to something and it's it not only came back with the threats of you know climate change and threats to democracy technology including ai and then i love that it it just you know it decided to finish off its list of threats which was even longer than that and then it said but stay optimistic as advice to me like you know uh, yes it looks like the world is going to hell but you know don't worry about it too much You'll be dead. You won't be alive. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Do you have like any ambitions to, because like, I think the concept of this is really neat of just using the, the way you use AI, asking AI a question and then just kind of leaning into that and just yeah. going like, I, I could see this as like a, a, a YouTube series, like I, uh, there's a melody sheep. They have these great uh, CGI images, and they're mostly like asking questions about the universe and using that. Like I could uh-huh. see like a YouTube sort yeah. of thing like this just going forward. Interesting. I mean, there certainly are ways to to expand it. I th- I think one of the things that works in this film is it is it's short it's densely packed and i kind of also thought about the narration not so much as straight ahead narration is almost as kind of prose poetry or song lyrics that it's very distilled and kind of suggestive and it leaves it to the viewer to see how it works in their lives and people have really responded strongly that 
it resonates for how they're feeling about their own life. So yes, it, you know, it, it could go further. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about the AI image generation algorithm is it's gotten better in the sense that it's more realistic. So the images are now, they're not as kind of fun and interesting. And there's also this concept of the uncanny valley where when things get pretty realistic, but just not quite right, that they just make you uncomfortable. And the more recent stuff I've tried with the newer algorithms, it just, it looks more like real people, but it's also not, it's not, you know, it's like a kind of flat animation, not interesting. The, the hands are usually a dead giveaway too, because they usually look like... Right, wrong number of fingers. And, yeah, yeah. Th- th- someone someone did like an AI thing of a uh, woman going crazy over a pumpkin spice. Uh-huh. <laughs> it was just like a murder of pumpkins. It was insane to look at. But yeah, th- like yeah. It, the, the images looked damn near real, but like the, the faces were like a little hyper expressionistic yeah. and hands right. were messed up. So like the, the image that you have as your background right now, like if you just move your head over just a little bit, you can see this guy. So, you know, I asked for a, 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 a guy sitting in a window with a giant, you know, giant windows looking out and it made this incredibly beautiful almost sculptural guy there it kind of reminds me there was an illustrator Folon who used to do a lot of uh new yorker covers you know just really be- beautiful beautiful imagery beautiful art it's harder to get that stuff now we ask everyone this i, I ask you the same uh, we have a what's in the box segment where we put in uh lesser seen movies that uh you think uh deserve more eyeballs on them but also i, I want to get like like a feature length but since you're working in shorts uh maybe you put a short in there as well oh uh a lesser so there's a absolutely so we do all sorts of feature documentaries and dramas and stuff a short that i absolutely love is uh, a film called undressing my mother which I believe is now available on Vimeo. Ken Wardrop did it. And it's a film with his mother that is just incredibly sensitive and lyrical. And you would think couldn't be done because it's partly about his mom taking a bath without her clothes on. But it's a really lovely film. This is, well, this was playing at Doc in NYC. Yes, it is at Doc NYC. It premieres on Thursday and it will be available online. Uh, And if you go to our website, which is, oh, actually, you can just go to lookingforwardfilm.com and that will take you to links to where you can watch it online. And as we go forward, it will be available in in other platforms and that's where you'll be able to find it, lookingforwardfilm.com. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious. To, and, and also with shorts, are, they're easy to recommend because it's like it, it's, it's 12 minutes. Just check it out. But I'm really right. curious to see what other people think of this because uh, it's very interesting. I need to find time to smoke a bunch of weed and watch this because I think right. I'm going to get something well, completely different. Well, well, one thing that has been great is when we you know send it to people uh, and they, almost always they come back with, can I send it to some other people? So it's it's taking on its own kind of virality. People want to share it with other people and talk about it with them and and see how they feel about it. So that's been really, really lovely. Well, then it was a really great short and definitely got me thinking. And thank you, C, for joining me today. And well, look you. forward to look forward to seeing what else you have and uh check that out in the future as well. Terrific. I'm here with Terrence Martin, the uh, writer, director, co-writer, co-director of Get Away With You Can't, along with co-writer, co-director, co-star uh, Dominique Braun. I guess we'll start off with that. So you did one movie, The Donner Party, previous to this. Years later, you come up with this. And by the way, th- this movie's great, and we'll we'll get into why uh, later on. But oh, um, what's it like with just the two of you making this movie? I'm sure there's more people, you know, cameramen, people behind the scenes and stuff. But I mean, oh yeah, two we writers, two directors, two two actors. It's like just the two of you, like kind of. Yeah, the idea the characters. idea was definitely spawned from my first film, The Donner Party. To give you like a little bit of um, backstory on that, like I had written a, I, I'm most, I would say I'm most comfortable as a writer, and I had written a a, a script about mountain men in the 1840s. It was actually the exact script of Revenant, but told from the boy who leaves Hugh Glass in the wild's point of view. And it it got a lot of traction around Hollywood. It it didn't get made. 
But I, people kind of want writers in Hollywood to just be very dim- dismissive about their material. But I'd spent like a year researching this time period and I wanted to make this movie so bad. I wasn't ever interested in like going up for another writing assignment. I think Scooby Dooby 2 was one that a, a, a development executive was talking about, you know, possibly giving me the the power to interview before, but I was so into the story that I said, like, what was this? I just spent a year writing. The manager wants me to just forget the script. It's not going to sell because Alamo had just come out and didn't make any money and no one was going to put the kind of money into it. So I said, like, I'm going to write a story set in this time period that I can shoot myself. And it was called The Forlorn. It was about a group from the Donner Party that snuck off to rescue the rest. It wasn't about the entire Donner Party. I'm just very passionate about it. Everybody I talk to, I'm like, hey, I can do this super cheap, like open water. I'll do it on my own credit cards if I have to. About a week later, I'm at a party and a producer overhears me. He says, hey, let me read this. I think I could get this set up for you. We're sitting in the production office the next Monday with the team that's up for the Oscar that that year telling me we're going to make this movie for like five million with a book of actors. He's just like, pick your two leads. They're great. So I picked Gary Oldman because <laughs> he's fucking fantastic. Because yeah. and I thought we could possibly get him. I didn't want to go for you know Brad Pitt or so I, I picked Gary Oldman and Barry Pepper because it's kind of like two people I saw playing the role. And they're like, no problem. Boom! Send it out. Both want to do the movie. Love the script. I'm like, oh my god, my Hollywood dream is coming true. But a year passed. They didn't commit the money to the project, and I finally told my producer, I'm like, hey man, I'm just gonna do this, act in it myself do it non-SAG. And he said, no, 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 I'll get you a couple hundred thousand dollars. So we were lucky enough to have Crispin Glover step up because he was going to play another character into the lead. And my friend Joey, playing Crawford, who you guys know, I think you've interviewed him to play the other lead. But to get that hundred thousand, I had to give a final cut, which I thought, hey, my producer's pretty cool. Like, of course, he's going to let me take the lead when it comes to editing the film. I wrote the story. All the actors want to do it because of my script. But as soon as we finished, he just said, hey, get out of here and like went into a shell of only he could make the editing decisions. And it was like having your baby like ripped apart in front of you. I mean, I never had so much creative pain in my life because I had put everything into this. It wasn't like I was getting paid a ton of money. The whole payment of the of the movie was that I got to tell my story. So he managed to put together the movie that it is. And I'm happy when people like it because I do think the performances are right. But I always felt like a strong disconnect from what the final product was, you know, even when I saw it sell to Showtime and was an early streamer on Netflix, I, I would read people's comments and say, yeah, exactly. That's like, you're right. I would not have killed the main character, you know, like, I don't want to ruin it for people, but you know, it's based on a true story. And I felt like we really needed to respect the people who, who really lived it. And it was put together with no sense of that. So it was uh, absolutely hard. Real quick with that. What, what, what were some of the, some of the uh, changes that they, they made? That, that you well, weren't really privy to or didn't really care for? Yeah, killing off characters that didn't die in real life. And it wasn't that there was like a person who wanted to buy the movie that was making these suggestions. It was just this person, the producer's taste, which didn't make any sense because he could have let me edit it and it still would have sold to the same place and gotten the same. But it was just him going crazy. And I get when people put their own money into something, it can be unnerving. But I feel like in the independent world, you got to trust the vision you invested in. Um, Espe- and it, especially and it, when it's as relatively cheap as it is. I mean, not, it, yeah. it's still a lot of money in the grand scheme of things, but like with relative it, it to a, other budgets, I think it's yeah, relatively cheap. Like, it went from like a $5, $5 million movie at that big production company that won the Oscar to a couple hundred thousand. But the couple hundred thousand was was very scared money. And I, I, at that point, was really ready to make the movie, but I, I would never take people's money when it's it's too, this industry is too crazy. Like if people are trying to like invest in something, invest in real estate, you know, to make money, but yeah. movie is a gamble. <laughs> but I think in the independent film world, filmmakers can learn, like, don't give up the final cut of your first film. Like if you're not making a ton of money, and it's not some studio giving you a huge opportunity what you're getting paid is to tell your story and show yourself as a director so if you lose that what you know hell? it's basically yeah. a, a waste i love when people like it because i think crispin glover's amazing in it i think joey's amazing i think all the actors are amazing. Crawford. <laughs> yeah he, clean yeah he's joey to me we <laughs> we I, he was one of the first people i met when i first moved out to la oh, we we're all real? just struggling writers actors there was a guy who like let us live in this building near Koreatown for like 600 bucks a month, like for these little studio apartments. And like, 
just get, like kind of gave struggling creative types a place to live and and we 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 shared that that building so so yeah like he stepped up and but um i just it, it's it's a real heartbreaker because i know how good that movie could have been you know yeah. and it would have been quite different even if i had just edited it i think it would have been quite a bit shorter it would have moved faster you would have understood the themes the main character the whole bone of the story was like his loss of religious values as he kind of like turned into this primal killer in a way you know and the justification for that but I, anyway I, I, Oh, yeah. real, real quick. One, one thing I want to point out with the Donner Party and get away with, if you can is that like, like the beginning of the Donner Party, for example, that has like a bunch of text and text and voiceover, both with the Donner Party and get away if you can, you're really strong in telling a story without exposition or without. So like when I'm watching the Donner Party at the beginning, it's, it has all this text like saying stuff that happened. I'm like, I don't think you really need that there. Cause like I'm, yeah, watching, the thing. I'm watching the thing. Yeah. I don't know all the details that they're giving me, but I don't think I care. I just, I know what this person's going through. I know they're stuck in this situation and kind of yeah. like, I, I get enough of it. And then in get away, uh, if you can, it's a lot more quiet movie. And yeah, you're just uh, throwing yeah, right and, in and you have to, you have to figure it out, which is yeah. kind of counter to like, what Netflix does a lot is like this voiceover where, you know, the person's sock size, their favorite movie, <laughs> you know, if they like to bowl or play ski ball, like, you know, everything. He was about a 27 them. women's with 36 inch ways. <laughs> yeah. And I get it. Cause in the idea of streaming, if someone doesn't like the character, they can go so fast. But I, I do like to just be in a quiet moment and kind of, get a sense of the people before I'm told what they are. And I wanted that for the Donner Party. I I fought hard against the voiceover, but again, I, I didn't have final cut. Yeah, I, I appreciate that way of storytelling. Both both can be great, you know? Yeah. I, I also... I love the voiceover at the beginning of Goodfellas. Don't get me wrong. Like, that's pretty amazing. So it's it's a convention that can be great. But in, in this case, and, and in Getaway If You Can, I really wanted people to have to say, hey, do I like this person? Do I care about them? Why should I care about them? I wanted all that to flow as you're watching the movie in a more um, open kind of way. Oh, and you know? uh, I guess kind of got away from it, but Dominique Braun, like how did the two of you get together to make uh, this one? Well, I had just fallen head over heels in love with her. I, she had studied acting in New York. She had studied acting in Argentina or directing as a, in uh, Argentina as an undergrad and acting in, in New York. But she had quite a bit of famous friends that had really bad experiences in the industry. You got to admit, in the mid 2000s, it was like Harvey was the main producer that people aspired to be. It was a hopefully it's a better place now, but it was a dangerous place for especially someone overseas to come and try to make their mark in the acting world. And she had so many friends with bad experiences that she pursued other things in life. But when we fell in love and she saw I was a director and I write every day and movies are my passion, I started to develop a story we could do together with no end date. So it was just about making a film we were proud of. It wasn't even to get it distributed. This was the idea. She, when I knew I was going to marry her, we took a trip to Chile and Argentina. And I said, hey, you know, there's this island that Robinson Crusoe, the, the book is based on the experience of the sailor on this island. Like, what do you say we just go there on a vacation for a couple of weeks, but bring a film crew and kind of develop the start of this movie and that's all the island footage you see all right so it's very experimental like that boat scene where we're fighting was the first thing we shot so we we used that as the catalyst for the next scene it wasn't like i was just locked into like one piece of text to be the movie which is another unfortunate part about filmmaking yeah of course like a great script can turn into a great movie. But when you're when you're on a low budget and, you, and you're dependent on the script too much, sometimes it can be a, a huge letdown because you're not able to capture. You don't have the money or the time to capture the depth that, that was on the page. So in our case, we're basically like riffing off one scene to another. We had a framework and, and it was a joyous way to make a film. But in the end, it took seven years. That more had to do with waiting on our actors and Ed Harris and Martina Guzman and, and, and those those elements. How many, how many members of the crew did you have on the on the island scenes? Because I, 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 I imagine it'd be island. like uh, uh, you, Dominic, and be like, who are, Lucio, I guess, is a cinematographer. Yeah. Like, 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 like grab one of the cameramen and go, hey, uh, just, just us three. Let's just go and do this. <laughs> well, Lucio, an assistant for the camera because you need someone to pull focus. Uh, right. I wanted to bring an editor because I wanted to be seeing how it was put together as we were going. We didn't do that on the first one. And it was you're just so overwhelmed by footage that I like to make films now like – that you're at least assembling it as you go and you can watch and think about maybe go reshoot a scene if you didn't get get the tone right. right. So I brought an editor and then a, a one-man sound machine. So 
who was really, really talented. He he held the boom and operated all the sound just with a with a chest package. It was definitely a run and gun type operation. And the boat captain as well, because you needed a good boat captain, because as you see, like we're shooting a lot on open water that all had to be synced up. We use walkie talkies and we hire a lot of local people from the island. There's like a lobster village on the island. We got in there just before lobster season. Once lobster season comes, everybody's working, working, working. But we got in there like two weeks before. So we were able to hire a lot of the local guys to help as well. Did the shoot go pretty quick for the most part? Did what? Like, like, what, what with like, with such a small crew, did a, did the shoot go pretty quick or did you have any trouble yeah i mean i mean we knew we had like i think what was it we had three weeks so for an independent film that was more i had 12 days 12 shooting days on the donner party and that's a sag production with limited hours so for me it was like we had all the time in the world you know like plus we didn't like have to nail a, a perfectly written script you know we were riffing so i thought it was amazing you know like i thought that time period was way easier than like when we had ed we had a very limited time so I would go to his house and work on the, the lines with him. And I would try to get in as much prep as I could because, you know, that was that was when we had to go union SAG, which is which adds quite a bit to the budget. And, you know, with his busy schedule, he was kind enough to give us days. But I would have liked another week with him to really, really explore his character. I mean, his, his, his character was pretty uh, I, th- I, th- I thought his character was pretty good in that. Well, he, he was for the amount of time we sure. shot. He was a, an a-hole for amazing. sure. But like it, it was uh, he, he played that a-hole well in that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and for me, it's like an impression of a father it's like i'm sure there's a lot of good sides to this to this character but it's the whole story is about all the negative the guy does so that's what you see we we actually shot a lot of bonding scenes of him and i working and you get a sense of like what we do we're like a tugboat operation that works in long beach and he was like really frustrated with the computer but when you when you like the man too much it didn't gel well with the climax of the story yeah because Because it felt like, oh, he's a pretty cool guy, you know? And some fathers are not at all cool. And they really are anyone in life that pressures other people. And I wanted to show those people and the negative impact they can have on on a, on a child's life or anybody who, who comes in contact with you, not even your parents. Well, I, I mentioned yeah. earlier that like a, a, lot of, a lot of your work, and this especially, is like kind of silent scenes. Uh, you know, the, yeah. what does a script for this look like? Is, is it just is it just action line, action line, action line? Or, or do you, yeah. put in, you put in dialogue and then just choose? not to shoot it on the day well i spent like 15 years like really trying to sell scripts in hollywood so i i think part of this movie is me frustrated with that process so i started this with like a loose framework i knew some of the beats i wanted to get to but i didn't tie it into dialogue to get there because i knew my wife dominique was so good at improvisation that we were going to find the scene and then it would lead to the next scene so we had whatever 40 scenes in a, in a certain arc to them, but with no dialogue. But then when it came to Ed, I went and did this process with him beforehand, like improvised, and we kind of came up with stuff. And then I scripted it out because I only had such a limited time frame. Yeah. I didn't want it just to be like, we got one scene because with this process, you got to give a lot of time and a lot of a lot of shooting. Um, I think I, I I didn't know beforehand, but it's very similar to the way uh, Terrence Malick shoots his films. Like yeah, everything's I, really I, open. I've heard about that. Yeah, I read a report actually after we made Donner Party about an actor who worked on one of his sets, and I was like, he's even more extreme than me. Like sometimes he doesn't even have a framework. He'll just give like an actor like a little note card that says, "Try to make that guy laugh," and that will be the whole day of shooting. You know, <laughs> they'll just keep. You know, he's he's earned the the money and the time for that. But I do, I know on the next one, I want to be a bit more formal and maybe even like go like Hitchcock style and storyboard everything out beforehand. But it was really a fun way to make a film. I I really, um, I really felt good about it because there's no wrong answers when when you're doing it that way. You're just discovering and that's a a fun process. Well, also like one of the great things about this story here, and I I suppose we can talk about it, but like, it it seems like the story that we're watching is not the story you're telling. Like them trapped on the boats, not them on the trapped them both that's him in trapped in the relationship and then she goes away to the island she's free but still trapped in a way and then there's yeah. you know the and so there's like a lot of there's a lot of double entendre double meaning metaphor in here how much of that was preconceived and how much of that was kind of like you say when you find stuff while you're shooting and how much of this was like uh editing and go oh you know what this yeah, kind of works i think that was a huge part of the conception of the movie we had um she she had been in a previous marriage and we had a lot of friends that that um did not seem happy in their marriage and in a way we wanted to like 
see if there was anything that they could ever get to bring out that happiness. So when people see the movie, sometimes they're like, whoa, like you guys must get along, not get along in real life. And it, it couldn't be further from the truth. We get along great, but we're, we're playing characters that are really at a rough patch. Most love stories begin, they meet, they fall in love. There's some trauma, they fall back in love. But we wanted to like throw two characters who are like at, right about ready to divorce, you know, and to see if there was any way and structure it like a thriller. I'm really playing with the thriller genre, right? Like when, when you get into the movie, you think, oh, shit, like anything could happen, I hope, you know, like murder. I even introduce a gun, which is like what they, I know the rule, of course, if you introduce a gun, it's supposed to go off, but maybe it is. It is, called, maybe get, it is. It is called get away if you can. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't yeah. scream horror thriller. I don't know what does. Yeah. And actually our, our distributor brainstorm really loved the thriller aspect. So they marketed it as like a straight thriller, which we were kind of pleased with because if you marketed it the other way, I don't think the twist in this case would come through because you would already kind of know what the movie was getting at. I know it upset some purists uh, in the genre, like, cause they were really hoping for, for the beats of a thriller, but I hope some people, and, and they were because they emailed me and find me on Instagram, were, were pleasantly surprised that it takes a turn away from what the genre is supposed to do. I, well, I think with like stuff like that, cause you know, I've seen like movies where like, I thought it was one thing and watch it and turn out to be another thing. Just from my own perspective, if I see that and the thing that it turns into is interesting, I'll usually yeah. be like, okay, I can go with this. If they, if it's sold as one thing and the thing it turns into is like, Oh, you just went for low hanging fruit. And this is like stupid then. Uh, but, but then again, that, that comes to the quality of the movie and my taste. So I, I guess it doesn't really matter one way or another, but yeah, but, definitely. I think it speaks to how people watch movies. Um, sometimes you just want a ham sandwich, you know, and, and yeah. sometimes you, this movie is not that it's a bit more challenging. You have to give a bit of yourself to the characters and to what it becomes. If you're in the mood for the ham sandwich, don't watch our movie yeah. at that time, it, you know, just go on more of a lobster and, roll. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. And what, I, like, a. Uh, so, I'm from uh, the East Coast, so I appreciate that reference. Like, my <laughs> town is, like, known for love. School. Well, I, I, I just know that uh, Dominique's character, like, you're like, Oh, hey, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, I, yeah got, totally. I got you fish. And she's like, I'm eating lobster, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. <It's great. laughs> yeah, that was a funny moment we discovered there because, you know, where we were shooting was a huge lobster town and lobster season just started. So we just see these boats roll in just loaded with lobster. And basically, for the last week, all the crew ate was lobster every day because it was not only cheap, it was like so plentiful. Yeah. So how, how do you how do you go about like raising money for this one? Because you mentioned the Donner Party, but get away if you can. It, like, yeah. Well, well, on this one, I, I didn't at first want to take any money because I didn't want to be whole. I wasn't going to give a final cut. And generally, unless you really have a track record of, of, of amazing films, you're not going to get final cut. So I, I, we funded the island portion ourselves. I, I was playing poker at the time and doing really well. It was like right in the poker boom. So I just put a percentage of the winnings aside for the film. And I, and I did it myself. It was a bit more with the SAG. So we took a loan from, from some friends. But it's hard when you get money involved. Like we had made a deal from the beginning. Hey, this might take a long time. And by a long time, we mean like seven years. Like we're in no hurry. And they're like, yeah, yeah, great, great, great. But then the time starts ticking and they're like, hey, like we gave you this money. So right before we um, were about to take it out to the world, I, I you know, we, we bought them out, made sure everybody was happy and, and nobody took a loss. And we didn't want money hanging over our heads when we released it because it was such a beautiful experience for us. And now it's doing well. And we found a great distribution partner and I'm really excited because these days a movie comes out and has a seven year life, you know, with all the different streaming platforms that pick it up. I just saw Suits, that show is like having a new life on Netflix, finding a whole new audience, you know, like I think that's beautiful. It used to be just opening weekend, you know, and one of the good things about streaming is, you know, there's um, so many platforms and so many different audiences. I'm really excited about Tubi because, you know, that's a, a whole audience that maybe can't even afford to, to to buy a film for a couple bucks and they can just watch it for free. And we started our exclusive with them sometime before the end of the year. So that'll be fun. So uh, yeah. you mentioned the distributor, like uh Everything I know about distributors is that they're shady and they're crooks. Like, <laughs> what, what's been your experience with that? Yeah, I mean, mostly they're shady, but because there's, there, it's so easy for them to cheat filmmakers. Yeah. But I, I had a really good production attorney. That was an, a, another thing. On Donner Party, I didn't use an attorney. It was just all handshake stuff, you know. Was, and I got like the best 
production attorney for independent film. He represented like Palm Springs, which I think holds the record for the biggest sale at Sundance. And and I just wanted someone who really contractually had my back. And he said, hey, I've been working with this company Brainstorm for years. And, you know, they're not A24, like they're not going to put a huge budget into marketing your film. But if you're willing to get out there and talk to movie lovers like yourself, you can do really well. And they're going to be straight with you. And I spoke to Michelle there and we both agreed, like, we're going to get the truth from them. And that's the hardest thing. Yeah. And I encourage any filmmaker to really do their research, call people. We called lots of filmmakers who had films released by them. That That's kind of the key because if somebody, if you call another filmmaker and they're like, hey, I haven't gotten one statement, I wasn't able to consult on my poster, then just run away. You know, these days you can just do it yourself. Is there a, deal with some. Are there any uh, distributors that you can kind of do like, l- l- like with your lawyer, you just, you pay your lawyer, whatever the fees, and then they do the work and then they're done. Then you don't have to pay them anymore. Like, are there any distributors that do that? Because from what I understand, it's, Hey, you put in all this time, all this risk and all this money and, you know, got everything together, put in all the work. And now you have the movie made here. Let me put it in this box and I'll take 50%. <laughs> like that, that just seems like, yeah, it, it well, seems like, so, it seems like a service you should just pay for. Like, here's however much money distribute the movie. And well, I think it's tricky because you don't want to have to be paying a distributor. They're the ones who are handling the ties to like Amazon iTunes, yeah. if they have a lot of other films, they can't just send you their their statements. So you have to really trust their word on how they are. But but yeah, I mean, I've heard of filmmakers who on the really low budget side going going with um, Film Hub, having good results with them. They're just basically like an aggregator that you, you give them all your materials and they, through computer means, distribute your movie. Apparently that works for some people. We thought this this movie needed a human touch though, you know? Yeah. They had put out quite a fil- few films. They just purchased a really hot movie out of Toronto this year. And they had put out a movie with Naomi Watts called The Wolf Hour, which was a, a big Sundance title. So we knew that they could put out a movie with care and love. And that's the main thing we wanted. Yeah. You never know how it's going to do or perform, but you want people who care about the project putting it out. A lot of distributors, they say they're going to do all this stuff, but then they just throw it up on the platforms, throw like a poster that makes it look like a total B movie and hope for the best. You're talking about kind of how people feel about Getaway if you can. I'm looking through the, like the IMDb reviews. Oh, and there's not many middling reviews. They're either, <laughs> I even love this movie or F- this movie in its ass. So it's like on, on, on one hand, like hearing bad reviews have to feel bad. But when the uh, reviews are that disparate from each other or, you know, that's you, you know, apart. We, we wanted to challenge people with this film. So it's very interesting for us. We, we'd rather have a passionate bad one than like, hey, this is another movie that's just like every other movie. Like, I love that we got some passion out of people. People started to say really nice things about our movie, especially on YouTube, where we premiered our trailer. And there was a dude that just came and started attacking everybody who said something nice about our film. But he was clearly very moved by the movie because he would go into why I should resolve things with my father. Like, he had clearly given it a lot of thought. And and I just thought, wow, like, to evoke that kind of reaction. And, And then people were, like, coming to our defense saying, no, no, you missed it. Like, he has to turn his back on the father. Otherwise, he can't. And that that was our intention, you know, but he couldn't he couldn't get behind it. So actually, yeah, like um, it, it, pro- it probably touched him more deeply than he realizes. I think so. And maybe later he realized, OK, cool. Like uh, if the movie gave me this much fire, like it's got to be worth something. I've always felt like even if I didn't love all the artistic choices in a movie, if it made me think it, it was a successful movie. I, I tested movies for years for the studios. I would get like Harry Potter be- when it was a rough cut and go to Chicago and recruit an audience. And I found that audience members... Their first reaction to a movie, sometimes if it's hard or challenging, they say bad, but they don't mean bad. They just mean like, I don't know how to process this. Yeah. So it takes a bit. Kubrick's films were like that. Look, man, 2001, when it came out, got bad reviews. Like for me, that movie is like the most rewatchable movie in history. I could watch that movie and I'm not a huge rewatcher of movies, but I rewatch 2001 Once a year, because I see something different or beautiful or, oh, wow, he means this. There's an ambiguity to it, you know, which I hope our movie shares at least the ambiguity part. I'm not going to compare at all our film to 2001. But Mother is another one. Did you see this movie? I love Mother. I love it, too. I I saw Mother in the theater 
and I was yeah, sitting in the too. like in the back left where I normally do. Uh, is the movie because I, I wasn't quite sure what to expect. You know, I knew it was Darren Aronofsky, yeah. so I'm watching the movie. And then as the movie's going, I'm starting to like eyeball the people down in front. And then the movie yeah. gets done, and people get up and like, what the hell was that? I don't. <laughs> yeah, all, all pissed off. Well, yeah, I, I'm I, mo- mostly confounded, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a lot of pissed off people. We we were members of the Soho House in L.A. And the, the curator, they had a movie program there with like a private movie theater. And the curator like went online and just blasted the film. And I thought like it was the same person who would like complain about too many Marvel movies. And I thought like how irresponsible, like even if you didn't like it, like this is an art house movie done yeah. at a huge budget level, like at least appreciate the heart and the passion, even if you didn't like it. But I was really... um upset with the critical response to that film because the studios just aren't going to pull the trigger on movies like that if they don't, if people hate on them, you know? So we're losing a lot of really interesting cinema. I, I loved in film school when I, when I started to watch like films of Godard, you know, in the new way where they would just do crazy shit and you'd be like, whoa, like I didn't even know films could do that. Really impressed. And I tried to include some of those touches in the Donner part. I mean, in a, in the Donner party when I, when I shot it, but and and, uh get away if you can when we edited it like there's a point where the camera actually moves and i got criticized for that but it's intentional it's meant for you to go oh like just get uneasy for a second because she's alone on the island like and it like draws your attention to like something quite jarring maybe it works maybe it doesn't but it's not a mistake like people were saying it's a mistake how could he leave speaking of camera moves and maybe this was a lot easier than than i think but it seemed like it was a difficult shot but you're doing this oh yeah and and there's and and then there's the the, you you know what i'm talking about there's a tent like right in the middle of it where where she's across the island like nope too high too low all right another take nope a little too like how, how, how how long did that take that was a hard one man just for that one shot i think we probably spent half a day lining up because she was across a whole channel of water and then in in post we had to like really bump up the colors on her jacket so you could actually see her figure and find it really quickly but i I like i like that shot a lot too it it was it was definitely a a challenging one that was like one of those undercover ones like like even as i'm watching it like it didn't click right away and then pretty much after the after that that scene passed i was like wait a second (laughs) they had to line the camera up with that like how (laughs) how how do you do that sort of thing I I, I I like those undercover ones where it's like it's real brilliant, but it doesn't hit you right away because it's not a showy scene. But it's not until you reflect on it later that you're like, wow, they did something there. Oh, yeah. Our, our, our guy that we brought to um, the island is named Lucio Bonelli, and he's one of the top. Argentina has like an amazing local cinema. They make, I don't know, 40 to 50 movies a year. And he's one of the top DPs out of Argentina. He just did a movie called The Extortion, which is on HBO Plus, which was their biggest hit in in many, many years in the theaters there, which I really recommend. Yeah, he's 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 an amazing DP. Yeah. Yeah. Ted, you write a lot. Is it going to be another? I I hope not. But is it going to be another 13 years till you get to make another one or (laughs) or like like, well, if you don't know, that's fine. But like if uh, if I handed you a blank check right now and said, go make whatever movie you want, like what what would you go out and do? Like, yeah. Oh, man. I don't have a blank check, by the way. This is all hypothetical. Oh, okay, cool. (laughs) Yeah, I would make another movie with Dominique as the star. I wrote a a script about kind of going to a fertility clinic in like 20 years time and the company's kind of nefarious and and that process gone wrong. I see that idea kind of popping up more, but I wrote it many years ago, but I, I thought she would be amazing about this woman that gets this kind of baby inside her. But I saw like, American Horror Story is doing that. And there's a movie called The Pod that just came out kind of yeah. about that. But my my take is more akin to Rosemary's Baby on it. So that would be my number one go-to if I got like a, a decent budget for a film right now. But but basically, I've been f- focusing on a novel for the last many, oh, nice. many years. Yeah. Oliver Stone wanted to do a movie version of an early version of it. Uh, it's not the same thing it is now, but it's definitely my piece of writing that's attracted the most attention in Hollywood. And it really needed to be a novel, not a script, because... It's just a long, deep story about fathers and sons in 1969 and the Vietnam War and the nature of man and war. And I'm a surfer, so they're all surfers. And, yeah. and it, it plays on a lot of themes of get away if you can, but much, much different. And um, actually, it's far. Yeah. I've always wondered this with the uh, surf because I've never surfed before. In fact, I'm not a fan of just going in the water in general if I can't see the bottom. But there's you probably there's a, Jaws too many times. No, no. I, I was like tubing in one of the lakes in Nebraska. You know, I fell off the tube and I was waiting for the boat to come around and something big just brushed against my leg. Oh. 
I don't know what it was. I'm like, get me the hell out of here. And then never again. Yeah. I, well, I mean, it's luckily, probably like a catfish or something, but. Yeah. Luckily I grew up like my front lawn. I grew up in this teeny little house, like in West Haven, Connecticut, right, right on the Long Island Sound. So my front yard was just beach and water. So it's like yeah. um, as natural to me as anything. Oh, but water. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what was your question? What, about what surfing, I wanted yeah. to ask was uh, the surfing. It, it has like a real spiritual aspect to it, but I've never yeah. seen that. I've never seen that. I, I guess I kind of saw it portrayed in the Point Break remake because like there was a way they kind of explained it. I'm like, okay, I, I think I get it. But like, as someone who surfs, like, can you kind of explain what what, sure, that, yeah. what, what that kind well, of feeling is? Point Break kind of confuses it with adrenaline, which is part of the surfing experience, but it's not the whole thing. Like there are guys who ride like those giant waves, like the 100 foot wave series. I don't know if you saw that on HBO. Those guys are adrenaline junkies. They get the pleasure of surfing. I just like riding waves, even if they're small, like you kind of you kind of lose yourself. You lose all. It's like a drug experience in a way, but very healthy. You know, you just become blank of mind, and you're just cruising. And then you're like, "Whoa, that just happened!" But you're never thinking about your responsibilities or what you have to do. The surf riding a wave lasts maybe like a minute at tops if it's a super long wave, but you just come out completely cleansed. Like that's why I think surfers get this reputation of being like all spicolied out. Because when you get out of the water, it's like you're really stoned. You're just like, oh, yeah, cool, man. Are like, you trying to snap back into reality? <laughs> yeah. Well, your brain is just like like you've been meditating for, for hours or something. So I guess it's hard to quantify exactly. But that's what it is for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, maybe I have to try that something. I, I I guess I got kind of some of that, like riding a motorcycle up in the mountains. You're just yeah. kind of going and just but yeah. mine, mine goes blank and then just kind of going about it. But it, it seems kind of similar to that. Yeah. Athletes say runner it's like a runner runners even get a high from it after a while i i did trek and was the captain of my track team in high school and I, <laughs> I never got any runners high but for surfing i really get it right away it's not for everybody it's so hard man it's not like snowboarding where you just go and you can learn in a couple of days like it takes a year of intense work to to even start to get into surfing and i wonder if that's like part of the meditation to where you can't think about what you're doing you just have to let your body do it it's like yeah play, because play, everything's playing drums so for fast. Exa- yeah, yeah playing drums for is- example if you think about what your right arm and left arm and right foot and left foot's doing you're just gonna yeah. get jumbled up and mess it up you just have to kind of do it yeah you, you got to do it that's how surfing is as well yeah and that's for me what good writing is too like when i'm really zoned in and i'm pulling, oh yeah it's just like flowing it's like you're tapping into some kind of i don't know something bigger than yourself for sure you get the uh because i hear people talking about like writer's block and i I would say just write through it you're gonna write crap but eventually it's gonna it's gonna kind of come back in do you have any sort of like what's your kind of process like if you get stuck on something yeah I, i like to think about it a lot i like to um at least write for free for for an hour a day where i'm not editing but sometimes in the editing i'll say oh my editing brain my critical brain will say that's not working and i won't be able it's not so much writer's block but i won't be able to figure out how to make it work so i'll take my time with it i'll take a break you know i don't i think a lot of writers just push through and they become hard and miserable when it's not working for me i just put it away and you know walk with my dog or go surfing or something like that and generally that the answer will come to me later but i I don't like sitting in front of the computer writing and feeling like this sucks i can't figure this out i just put it away like i do this whole work for joy not not for struggle there's enough struggle that comes from trying to do it well that I'm not going to put myself through any manufactured struggle. Yeah. But you talk about a high, like what it, it, you got a scene, like you write it and it was like, Oh, f- killed it. oh I, knew this. <laughs> I wish I could yeah. show someone to read this, but no one likes reading screenplays. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the ego part of it. Like you, you definitely feel that too. Oh yeah. I should get an Oscar. But, but for me, it's like when you like kind of just discover these people doing these things and it feels like so real to you that, it's like you found it or something. It's yeah. like finding a treasure. Um, but yeah, when you do it well, you're like, okay, cool. Like, but but that part is like more ego, which I try not to get involved with with the writing. I try to like um, just just make it real and true to what it has to be, rather than say it's right or wrong. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I guess uh, I guess we'll end on this. I, I had a great time talking with you, by the way. Yeah, me too, man. <laughs> you, you, did, you, cool you handled your hangover very well, man. I would have never known. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I got in the interview high, so the inter- the hangover just went away. Yeah, but uh, yeah. we we do have the what's in the box segment where we have people put in uh, movies that they think are underseen that they really like, or maybe something doesn't have to be underseen. Maybe it's a very well seen, but it's personal to you. Like, what's a movie you'd like to put in the box? 
Well, I guess I, I hope it's on Netflix in the America too. But I noticed the other day, um, Martina Guzman, who plays the sister of Dominique in the movie, she's a, a top Argentine actress. And um, I noticed her husband, who was a top Argentine director, had a retrospective on our Netflix the other day. His name is Pablo Trafera. And they did they made a movie called Elefante Blanco, The White Elephant. Okay. Um, which 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 is about the Vijas in Argentina. There's these giant cities that had developed out of just how homeless encampments, like hundreds of thousands of people live in them and, and they don't own the land. And it's about this phenomena in Argentina. And it's really a great place to start with this director, Pablo Trapero. If you look on your Netflix, they had five of his films just playing as almost like a re- retrospective. And he made a movie called Crane World, which is black and white about an Argentine worker. It's absolutely amazing. And Lion's Den and I would start with uh, the white elephant and go from there and discover uh, a foreign foreign uh, director that really knows his stuff. All right. Yeah. Cool. Um, one last thing. I meant to ask this sure. earlier, but we got we got so wrapped up in other stuff. There's a full frontal scene. Is that all you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All but right. the, congratulations. The, <laughs> no, no. But the idea. It's it's funny you ask about that. It's kind of a spoiler warning, I guess, for people who haven't seen it. But. I don't know about you, but when I would see sexual movies yeah. when I was younger and it would look like the actor like just came out of a cold bath. You know what I mean? Yeah. There was no charge, no nothing. Like, and we did not want that. We wanted it to feel like a really charged up moment. And I think maybe because of the the fear of the ex, that's why it was like, you have to be careful with that idea. But that was the idea is it like felt very believable. And um, I hope it yeah. did. I th- We've gotten a lot of comments that said it. Like one one reviewer was just obsessed with whether it was real sex or not. Like he, uh, we did an interview with him. Well, whether it was, was or I mean, whether it was or not, it certainly felt that way. Like the the yeah. intimate, the intimacy and the sexiness and like the the desires all kind of come through in ways yeah, that for, usually it feels it feels titillating course, in right? other movies, but this it feels more realistic. Which I well, guess could be t- titillating, but it's, it's definitely realistic. Well, yeah, I I, th- I think of it like, you know, when you watch those films when you're young about like tribal New Guinea or the Amazonian people and they would be naked, but it felt very real and good. It didn't feel exploitative. When you watch sex scenes on most movies, like the camera moves super slow and the skin is glistening. And the the backlight light. and the smoke coming yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> The saxophone music like, in the back. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. I didn't. We didn't want that at all. You know. <laughs> I, I I would I would like to kind of maybe someone does like a supercut of this with all the sex scenes with like MacGruber sax music in the background. Yeah, that, that, that could be a thing, I guess. But I'd be fine with that. Anyway, Terrence, thank you for joining me today, and uh, come back no on anytime. I'd love to talk to you again, uh, and uh, let us sure. know if you got anything else coming up in the future because we'd like to see it. Right on, man. I appreciate your uh, helping film and talking about it every yeah. week. Well, with yeah. this one, it's easy. <laughs> it, it, it's like if I watch it, it was like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, I imagine that must be tough. <laughs> I, I had I had to do that once and it it, it wasn't fun. But I mean that yeah. that's it's kind of like a part of just reviewing movies, I guess. But yeah, I, I noticed it, 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 if I don't like something, I like to try to at least figure out who would because it's like this one's not for me. Unless unless the movie's like uh, unless I think the movie's irresponsible, then I'll well, get... I know as a as a filmmaker, I'd rather have someone say from the beginning, "Hey, man, I had issues with your film. Can we talk about that?" Yeah, and I, I might say, "Yeah, sure." Like as long as it's like a good spirited conversation. I think Mark Marin does a good job of you can kind of tell when he doesn't like the product that the person came on because he'll kind of say, so what are we trying to say with this? You know, there's a way to say it without being hurtful to the person because, because it's all subjective, right? Yeah. but also yeah. like the the uh, hey I hated your movie want to talk yeah sure but also like yeah. when I, so when I'm doing or like just the, don't talk to people when you hate their movie you know that's another strategy too it's yeah. like hey man like like I'm gonna pass on the interview it's just I didn't really connect to the film but thanks thanks well like, well, like the yeah. mo- most of the interviews we do are different than this one because this one was yes. just me uh, Jason from Four Five Podcast listen to that by the way yeah but, uh, I'm stuck I, we're he, doing he, the top five uh, stuck in nature films and that comes out in early November oh nice yeah. Yeah, I look forward yeah. to that. He, he's a good guy too. But like, th- this is a little different than most because, like, most of the time I do interviews, it's to promote the movie. So when I've agreed yeah. to the interview, I haven't seen the movie yet. And most oh. of the time, most of the time, I kind of know someone who's involved or it looks interesting. So I know that 
I'm probably sure. gonna at least think this is okay at the very least. But there was one time where it was like, Ugh. yeah, and that that was a that was a weird interview because like I you know I don't want to talk like like what you were saying like have that conversation about I didn't like your movie let's have this conversation couldn't really yeah. do that in that because it's more of a promo thing so you don't want to come sure out sure right. yeah you can always say. I like the cinematography. That's always a line in LA when you know they didn't like the movie, but they have to say something nice. Wow. Amazing cinematography. The coloring on this movie is fantastic. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and then you could talk about that, that blue, the, that one scene. Just who doesn't like blue? <laughs> yeah. Wow. You had right actors on. in this. Yeah. <laughs> they did some work. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, I'm going to let you go, but uh, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me today. And sure, man. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to do this soon. And if you ever make your way out to Colorado Springs, hit me up, and uh, we'll party it up. Right on, buddy. You have a good day. <laughs> you too.